Okay. All right. Lewis, I think you should be able to share when you're ready to share. Okay. Well, let me give you an introduction. Um, I'm Luke, Luke Curtis. I have been a um, started photography when I got my first uh, camera back in, uh, this is going to date me a little bit, but back in December of 1978. And uh, I started with photography uh, just like enjoying taking pictures. Uh, and uh, that uh, summer of 79, I ended up joining the Navy. And that kind of uh, launched me forward, uh, headed in the direction of a photographic career. I started out uh, with the Navy um, in 79 as a uh, hospital corpsman. And I had obviously had a passion for photography. I knew that was it was something I wanted to do. And, and so I um, ended up running into a biomedical photographer and um, been a few years trying to get into biomedical photography school in 1986 I did and uh, it was a uh, eight month uh, course um, and I'm having trouble it's like there's a strong audio yes someone may have some background noise or anything like that and the next thing I really want maybe everyone like could mute um find out you can actually mute everyone Glenda that's what recording is Can I, uh, okay, can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, I'm uh, sorry about that. I just, it was just so loud that I. Glenda, I think that he's muted. There we go. Is that, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So uh, in 1986, I went to biomedical photography school up in Maryland and uh, it was an eight month uh, long course and uh, graduated from that and got my certification in biomedical photography. And I spent from 1986 until, oh, 1996 in the Navy. I ended up, my last duty station was Corpus Christi and so I worked, you know, full time every day uh, as a hospital corpsman. But at the same time, I was also pursuing uh, other avenues. I worked with a couple of professional photographers who lived in Corpus Christi and got involved in weddings and, uh, you know, all, all different kinds of photography. Eventually, uh, I left uh, the Corpus Christi area and moved to the DFW area in 2004, where I worked for nine and a half years in uh, at Children's Medical Center in the marketing department. Uh, as a commercial photographer. Uh, and now I currently, well, in 2004, I started working for Acme Brick as a commercial photographer in their marketing department. So I have a, a very broad uh, range of experience. Most of my early on experience had to do with uh, portrait photography and, and weddings and obviously commercial photography in the medical field, dealing with people and that sort of thing. Um, in 2014, when I left at Children's, um, I decided I wanted to pursue wildlife photography. Uh, I'd always loved wildlife. Um, in fact, when I was in high school, I wanted to eventually be a wildlife artist. That never happened. I don't think I was actually good enough. But so then I started pursuing a wildlife photography six years ago, and I've been doing it ever since and uh, really enjoy it. And so hopefully I can help you guys and encourage you with um, with uh, developing your skill set and being able to to um, you know get the kind of photos that you're you're interested in. Obviously, there are two basic um, kinds of photographers: those who are just really interested in documenting uh, the birds that you see, and for you, you just you just want any kind of photograph that resembles the the bird that you saw for identification purposes that sort of thing but then you have the next level of photographer and that's the person who not only wants to document the 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 bird but actually wants to get a photo worthy art worthy uh, results and so it's a little it's a little difficult um 
oh, how should I say, um, to teach to a broad group uh, because they're, you know, you can get, give little information or you can give a lot of information. And so um, I did create a, a slide uh, show presentation. Um, the only thing I'm not sure about with it is that for some, I don't know if some of you will think that it's, it's too deep and too much uh, and others may think that it's spot on or they want more. And so, um, you know, let's, let's open it up. Uh, initially, I'd be interested in knowing uh, how many people are just interested in photography per se, being able to just get the shot, have a photo that represents what they're looking for. And then those who are really looking for much more information such as shutter speeds, um, in order to stop, you know, say a bird is flying and that sort of thing, you know, kind of what, what uh, is everyone's uh, main interest? I'm interested in, in getting the artsy photography. That's what I'm about. Okay. okay. I'm also how about, how about in equipment pardon? too. I'm a little bit interested in equipment. Okay. Um, now I did send, I did send um, a, a PDF out and I think that uh, Glenda had forwarded to everybody. Did everybody get that? Okay. <laughs> and so it, it had, obviously I, I you know, I'm, I'm a strong Nikon enthusiast and on, um, to be very honest, it's generally the the system I recommend and not because uh, I've just been shooting Nikon my whole life. I, I do have experience, some experience with Sony and more experience with Canon. And for me, uh, ergonomically, uh, I've just always preferred the handling of the Nikon. And when it comes to the menu system structure, I've just, have always felt that Nikon is a little more user-friendly. That doesn't in any way, shape or form, um, say that Sony or Canon are not good systems. It's just that for me, it, Nikon is just my preference. Um, so um, you, saw the, you saw the list. I think the biggest thing uh, to understand, and, it's, and this is always the big thing, it's money. Um, how much money do I wanna spend? But one of, the, one of the key things that you need to understand is that what makes uh, say a, a lower end camera less desirable than a higher end camera are what I could like to call bells and whistles. And what I mean by that is, uh, let's say you buy a bridge camera and a bridge camera is a camera that everything's inclusive. In other words, the lens is built onto the camera body. It doesn't have interchangeable lens capability, but on the other hand, it may have a tremendously long zoom capability. Okay. Now, oftentimes those particular cameras will have a combination of a uh, optical zoom and a digital zoom. So one thing to note with regards to that is optical zoom is always better than a digital zoom because when you get into the digital part, uh, it's just enlarging what it's already seeing. Uh, not by means of optics, but by digital work. Um, so where, where those particular bridge cameras are nice because they're all inclusive, you're spending your money one time, you don't have to worry about upgrading lenses, that sort of thing. What makes them a little more difficult is that they don't have a bells and whistles. And what I mean by that is they don't have a lot of buttons that allow you to access things like maybe ISO, uh, and other features quickly and easily, which when you're photographing wildlife, uh, uh, it, you know, that those precious seconds that you're spending trying to make an adjustment, you could actually lose the subject that you're trying to photograph. And so uh, as you get into the, the price of your systems, what tends to happen is they have better sensors, they may have more megapixels, uh, but most importantly, they have buttons that make changes like ISO, um, the mode that you're in, whether your program, after priority, shutter priority, manual, they just make access to the features and adjustments much, much quicker. And obviously speed uh, when it comes to wildlife is, you know, it's essential, okay? Uh, so does anybody have any questions that, at, up to this point? So, so Lewis, can uh -huh. I make a suggestion here? Um, 
I, I think I think there are probably two things that all of us want to hear about. The okay. first one is probably the issue of portraiture, right? Uh, if we catch okay. birds static, how do we take pictures of them? Okay. Well, and this then, and then the more and then the more challenging issue is either a situation where a bird is in defilade. It, in what? In defilade, meaning, you know, it, if, if you use the normal autofocus on a static photo, uh -huh. you're not going to get the bird because it is in, you know, in flight. flight. Well, not so much in flight, but in, you know, brush. And you need to autofocus as opposed to do an automatic focus. Okay or where you get a bird in flight, where you want to try to freeze frame the bird as it's flying. Okay. So well, I would say those two situations, the, you know, the portraiture where you get a bird that's static mm -hmm. and then the situation where you have a more challenging, either, you know, autofocus, non-focus situation or a flight situation are sort of the, I think the things we could all use. Okay. Uh, well, uh, answering that question and, 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 uh, and giving you the feedback for that is going to require a couple of different um, topics. Um, now, I have, I like to, sh I shoot in a way, I'm going to tell you that I, I kind of find myself to be a peculiar apple uh, when it comes to photography and probably compared to a lot of other photographers out there because uh, I tend to shoot uh, as a situational photographer, situational approach. And so I think the, the one of the biggest things that comes to play with the wildlife photography is mental preparation. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you go out, there are a lot of things handed to you the moment that you go out obviously one of the first things that's handed to you is the weather. You may have sunshine, uh, you may have fog, you may have overcast skies, you may have wind. There is just so many different elements that, that affect the scene and affect um, the process by which you'll, you'll move forward to shoot photos. So when I get out to my car and, and understand that I, uh, you, have to be a, you have to be a thinker, you have to train yourself to think, you have to train yourself to, to analyze and make decisions before you actually need to snap the shutter. And, and the more decisions that you make before you get to that point, uh, the more prepared you're gonna be and the more successful your results are gonna be. And so uh, with that in mind, so um, when I go out, uh, and this is one of the early things that I make a decision about is, if I go outside and it's a clear sunny day, I say to myself, hmm, okay, today I can shoot perch shots and today I can shoot action flight shots. And you say, well, how did you make that decision? Well, it's sunny because it's sunny. That means I have more light. And because I have more light, that means I can shoot at higher shutter speeds. And uh, shutter speeds are, are very valuable. Obviously the faster uh, of a shutter speed that you use, the more stop action effect you're gonna have on the bird. The slower the speed, then the less you're going to have control of that. So that's one of the one of the first uh, answers I get mentally when it comes to preparation and when knowing how I'm going to move forward and what I'm going to attempt to shoot. Now I've I've changed changed that a little bit now because I've actually finally sort of caved in to higher ISO. Uh, I still am not a, a a big fan of it or proponent, but. Uh, I've become aware of a, a software program that I finally gave it a try and I'm happy with the results. And so I'm a little more flexible about it, but I still not a preference. So when I say, when I talk about situational photography, I go out and I say to myself, okay, Lou, are you going to shoot perch shots or are you going to shoot flight shots? So when it's sunny, I tend to say I'm doing both today. So let's say I'm out driving and I will tell you that probably in Texas, I would probably say about 95% of my photography is from my car. 
And why is that? Well, because first off, I don't want to walk miles and miles and miles. I cover a lot more territory in my car. Secondly, a car affords you uh, a form of a blind. Even though your car uh, may not be painted in camo, it still makes your presence uh, less formidable to a wild bird. And so now let's move forward and talk about um, how do you approach? All right. When I was a photographer growing up learning, there are a lot of rules in photography. And I think one of the shortcomings uh, of today's digital world is that people are learning at a very, a very rapid pace, um, but not everyone is being taught the rules of the trade, the no's and the yeses and, and what's better and what's worse. One of the things that I learned early on uh, in the days of film dealt with how do you get the best possible, possible photograph? And you're going to get that by um, shooting at a lower ISO. Generally, the rule of thumb was the slower the ISO, the better. Back in those days, they had Kodachrome 64 and, and Kodachrome 100. Um, and, and that rule, in my, in my opinion, hasn't changed. If you can shoot a digital photo at, a thou, at 100 ISO, it's going to be much better of a result than if you're shooting at 1600. A lot of people today, uh, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not a proponent and, 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 and understand I have a very strong opinion because I grew up in a day that, you know, you didn't have autofocus, you had manual focus. You didn't have auto ISO, you had manual ISO. Everything was manual. The f-stop was manual. The shutter speed was manual. There were no program modes. All you had was manual. That was it. And so I learned, uh, I learned the hard way, but I learned. And I will tell you that today as a wildlife photographer, I still shoot manual. I don't ever shoot program. Now, when I first started this several years ago, I, I started with that priority. Uh, but then I, I got in a situation that, that caused me to shake my head and go, you know what? No, no more aperture. This is, I'm going manual. So I'm strictly a manual photographer. And I will tell you that if uh, Luke Curtis can shoot manual, any one of you can shoot manual. And uh, it's not as difficult as uh, a lot of people make it out to be. Uh, and you become more in control of what you're doing. Now let's get back to the exposure thing. If there's ever anything you're gonna write down, what I'm about to tell you, write it down. Because what I'm about to tell you for me, in my experience, is the number one best two approaches for the two different types of photography you wanna shoot. If you wanna shoot uh, perched photographs, and you want to get a better detail and better color, better contrast, better everything, then you're going to do it this way. And this is your starting point. Understand, this is, this is not a hard line. This is your entry point uh, from which uh, you can make adjustments, okay? So if I go out, I'm going to put my ISO at 400, okay? Now you say, why not 100? Well, because they're birds, they're animals, they move around. If I knew they weren't going to move around, I would put it at 100. But so, yeah, ISO start at 400. You can even put a slash there and put 800. 400, 800. Let me tell you something about ISO. ISO is destructive, okay? So a lot of people out there uh, teach auto ISO. Not a good thing to learn. And I'll tell you why, because auto, you can have your camera set on manual f-stop, manual shutter speed, and the moment you put your camera on auto ISO, it turns back into a program camera, okay? So auto ISO is not a good thing. And I'll tell you why, because you can't control it. It's gonna make the decisions for you. And most cameras in the way that they're designed are designed to handle 800 and maybe up to 1600 ISO inherently through the system. Anything higher than that happens through algorithms and digitally, okay? What does that mean? It means it's not a good thing, okay? And so um, you, you shouldn't get into this habit of automatically letting the camera run wild and, and do whatever it wants to do with your ISO. You should set limitations because again, uh, I, ISO, 
the higher the ISO, the more destructive. You're always going to get a better shot. And I'll give you an example. If Luke Curtis goes out today or tomorrow and I'm going to go shoot a scenic, I have a basic way that I shoot scenics. Okay. I take a tripod, I set my ISO at 100. Okay. And I adjust my f stop anywhere between 11 and 22. And then I adjust my shutter speed to whatever I need, which is why I have a tripod. Now, why do I do that? Because I'm going to get, I'm going to get uh, the best color. I'm going to get the best uh, sharpness, the best contrast. Why? Because I'm at, shooting at a lower ISO. Another rule that you find out that we learned a long time ago is the sharpest point on any lens is generally two stops from wide open. Now, is anybody here uh, unfamiliar with what I mean when I say stops or f-stops or aperture? Does anybody not know what that is? Okay. Um, let me see if I can pull up. Uh, let's see, I've got a, I've got a PowerPoint, and I'll. Can you guys see that? Not yet. <laughs> okay. So let me, let me see how I share it. Let me. Um, I think you have see. to hit the green share screen button at the bottom of your screen. Okay, share screen. Okay, there yeah. we go. There you go. Okay. And. It says desktop. It's got an exclamation mark. So yes, choose desktop. Okay, and then click share. Yes. Oh, oh. Did that do anything? Okay, now what am I doing? Okay, here we go. Zoom.us will not be able to record the contents of your screen until it is quit. Ah, isn't that interesting? I don't want to quit Zoom. I guess we're not going to do that. <laughs> uh, I guess, okay, well, that's something to learn. All right. It's not letting you share? It, it's saying I'm going to have to quit the Zoom meeting because it's got to make a, a change in my uh, system preferences. Oh. Okay. So we'll just forget that. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I've, I've never actually done this class with anyone. So, and this is my first time using this laptop to do it. Um, anyway, uh, so here we go. Let me give you this info again that I was talking about that you want to write down. If you want to shoot, if you're going to shoot a perch shot, you got a bird that's sitting on a branch. It's really not moving. It may move a little bit. My recommendations are 400 to 800 ISO. On overcast days, you may have to go to 600, 1600, okay? Um, so that would be your range. 400 ISO up to 1600 is a range that I kind of suggest. 1600 only if you really have to. And you say, why? Well, because the higher your ISO, the more noise your image is going to have. Does everybody understand what noise is? That's like grain, okay? And, and the more that you have, the more it softens your image and it just doesn't, it just doesn't look as nice. So 400 to 1600, 1600 only if you have to. Then um, you're going to set your f-stop at whatever, you know, you can usually wide open, ideally two stops from wide open if you can do it. And then your shutter speed is going to be could be as low as 250th of a second. Could be as high as a thousandth. It's, it's all dependent on the amount of light, okay? Um, because you're shooting perch shots, you don't need to have a thousandth of a second. You don't need to have two thousandth or four thousandth of a second. Why? Because the bird isn't moving so much, right? So that means you can get away with, with slower shutter speeds because you're not having any motion. The bird is stationary. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. So, so Lewis, when, when you say wide open or as open as possible for the f-stop, what does that mean in terms of the other settings? So we've, we've already set sort of the, the, uh, we've already set the ISO. So what are you talking about with regard to wide as wide open as possible? 
Well, obviously, what makes photography work is light. Okay. Then we have some factors, some limiting factors when it comes to photography, and that is the lens itself. Uh, all lenses have what's called a maximum lens opening, meaning the largest hole. Okay. Uh, every lens, in case you, every, anyone does not understand this, there is a there are a series of blades in a lens that when you uh, adjust your lens opening, they will either expand out or they will close in. And when they expand out, the opening is as big as it can get. And when they close down, the opening becomes smaller, smaller, and smaller. And that whole idea there is to affect the amount of light entering the lens and hitting your sensor and giving you exposure. So, um, when we start getting into, into these big beasts of lenses that a lot of us will use, Tamron, uh, Sigma, or um, you know, Canon, or Sony, or Nikon lenses. And when I say that, for example, you know, Tamron and Sigma both make 150 to 600 millimeter lenses. Uh, Nikon makes a 200 to 500. Uh, Canon makes a 100 to 400. Um, Sony makes a 200 to 600. So you got these super zooms. But unfortunately, because those, those zooms are carrying so much focal length, so much millimeter, um, in order to keep the lens smaller, in order to keep the cost of the lens down, they have to limit how much glass they put in it because the, the glass in a lens is what makes a lens expensive, okay? And so uh, in order to keep the price points so that we can afford them and so that they sell well, um, you, you, know, you end up with lenses that have a lens opening of say F5.6. Uh, some have like, well, the Nikon 200 to 500 is a straight F5.6. It means when you open that lens all the way up and you zoom from 200 to 500, the barrel does not extend. It doesn't get any longer. And that's what affects uh, light absorption in any zoom is does the barrel extend and if it does when that barrel gets longer it literally means that when light hits the front of the lens and gets to the sensor the light is dropping off okay when that barrel when the barrel doesn't do that then you, the amount of light doesn't change or it, it stays consistent when it gets to the sensor so uh, I, I like to call that variable a variable f-stop lens, okay? So you have some long lenses that are a fixed um, f-stop, and then you have others that are variable, that the, the widest opening mathematically is going to change as the barrel becomes longer, okay? And so um, one of the other things that, that's getting lost in photography is Back in my day, you learned all the shutter speeds, you learned all the f-stops, and you learned all the ISO numbers. And um, what that means is this, I can sit here and go f2, f2.8, f4, f5.6, f8, f11, f16, f22, f32, f45, f64, okay? Uh, that's, that, that was important and that was taught extensively you know, shutter speeds, eighth of a second, 16th, a 30th, a 6th, a 125th, a 250th, 500, ISO 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200. And why is that all, why is that relevant? Because um, it's a rule called the rule of doubling and halving. Has anybody ever heard of that rule before? The rule of doubling and halving? Okay. Yes. Not very many. Not very many people have. And that, and that again, is because photography is really not being taught anymore. Uh, we're all becoming very dependent on the camera doing all the work. And so we're not, we're not being taught how it all functions and it all plays out and all comes together so that you end up getting great results. The whole idea of doubling and having is this. Every click, okay, every full click of the f-stop, and a full click is... 2.8 to f4, f4 to 5.6, that's the full click. That's considered a stop. Now, 
I'm going to, we're going to use this word stop uh, interactively. Okay. Because basically what it's saying is when we say it, that's a full stop. Okay. W what we're saying is that's one full click of whatever that adjustment was. And what that means is this, if I, if I click from F4 to F5.6, that's one stop. At the same time, if I go from 1 25th of a second to 1 250th of a second, that's one click, one stop. Okay. If I go from ISO 100 to ISO 200, that's one click, one stop. That's the rule of doubling and having. And what that basically means is this. With our exposure systems, with our metering system, the whole idea is that you are taking your ISO, your shutter speed, and your f-stop, and you're bringing all three of those together to give you what is called equivalent exposure, okay? In other words, balanced exposure, so that what you end up with is a properly exposed image. Now, where does this rule of doubling and having come into play out? Well, it, it comes out this way. Let's say you're photographing a bird and you photograph anything it perched like what we've been talking about. You've got your shutter speed at 500th of a second. Let's say your ISO as at 800 and let's say your f-stop is 5.6. Well, now you start to see the bird acting a little different and it looks like maybe it's gonna fly, right? And so you wanna be able to adjust your shutter speed so you can stop that motion of that bird. Well, if you're at uh, 500th of a second, let's say you make a decision that I need to shoot a 2,000th of a second. Can anybody here tell me how many stops that is? Two stops, okay, two stops. And so what does that mean? Well, it means if my lens is a 5.6, that means the, the maximum opening is 5.6 and I'm already there, can I add two more stops of light in order to get my faster shutter speed? No. And I know a lot of you are shaking your head right now and you are going, whoo, what are you talking about? You are, whoop, I'm a, we're on space right now and I, I'm floating. I'm, what I'm trying to get at here, what I'm trying to help you understand is that there's a lot more technical parts to photography than what many of you have ever heard or seen. And why is this important to understand? Because the more that you understand, the more in control you're gonna be and the better the results you're going to get. The greatest invention today, educationally for all of us, is a super place called YouTube. And I, what I'm going to suggest to you is go to YouTube and find videos and study these videos, watch them and learn about the rule of doubling and having. Uh, learn about equivalent exposure. I mean, I could sit and talk about this for a long time, but the fact is all of you need to learn it individually because we all learn at different rates, right? At different levels. If one of you started teaching me about astronomy, I would probably have to put up my hand and say, could you slow down? Because I don't get it. And, and so, you know, we all, we all aspire in, in, in at different rates of speed. And so that's the benefit of YouTube. You can actually isolate and study and watch videos on particular things. Uh, and you can watch those videos over and over again, okay? All right. So again, we, we've discussed our basic starting on a perched bird, okay? By 500th of a, a second, uh, ISO four, uh, 400, 800, 1600, depending on the amount of light. And uh, f-stop is gonna be f5.6. If you, you might be able to be at a higher f-stop. Once again, it's gonna depend on the light, okay? What you just need to understand is that you don't have to be really, really up high on your ISO, you can control that. Now, when it comes to birds in flight, and I am totally serious when I say this, man, you have to go the other end of the spectrum on the shutter speed. 
and I will tell you personally myself, unless I'm in a bind, I generally try to do my flight action shots at one four thousandth of a second, period. Okay. Um, sometimes I find I still don't get the shot. And sometimes I find the shot turns out great. Um, as with anything, one of the factors that comes into play when it does come to photographing uh, birds in flight and action is the size of the bird. Who do you think is who do you think is faster and quicker, a bald eagle or a ruby crown kinglet? Ruby crown kinglet. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, uh, if I'm out for I have photographed bald eagles in flight, and I've shot as slow as one five hundredth of a second of a bald eagle in flight, and the shot came out great. Am I going to do that with a ruby crown kinglet? Oh no, 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 no. Those guys are like little jitterbugs, aren't they? I mean, they're all over the place. One second they're here, then they're there. Very hard to deal with. So it's very, very important to have enough shutter speed to stop that motion, okay? Um, so that'll be my starting point. I'll set my shutter speed at 4,000th of a second, okay? And then I'll take a look at the light. I'll take a look at the meter and uh, I'll set my, my f-stop at 5.6. Um, some of you, if you have the, the Tamron, you may have to set it at uh, 6.3 because you're gonna be at, at, at full zoom, maybe at 900 mil, uh, well, I'll have to explain that later, at, at the 600 millimeter setting. Um, and so then you have to adjust the ISO based on the, on the current information. If you're at 4,000th of a second and you're at wide open and that's 5.6, depending on the amount of light you have, that'll determine what your ISO ends up being. Does everybody understand that? Anybody have a question about that? Yes, this is Nancy. Can you talk about how you would then determine the ISO? Would you go up on it then? It all depends on what the meter says. If you know, if you're in a shrub photograph in a ruby crown kinglet, you're probably going to have to go up. Uh, if you're um, out in out in out in light, you you might be just fine. It's always going to be a situational uh, thing when it comes to that because every situation is going to be different. The amount of light is going to be different, and so you um, you know use it as a starting point and just try so accordingly. I wish uh, I wish I could I wish I didn't have to quit Zoom to get to my slides because there was something. Um, what I, let me tell you something that all of you can do uh, in the next day or two go to uh, Google, click on images, and in the search, uh, and if you got notes, write this down, in the search, uh, put in um, photography image histogram. Is, is there anybody here who doesn't know what the histogram does and what it is? Anybody? Everybody knows what a histogram is? Okay, um, a histogram, so uh, if you have a mirrorless, uh, your histogram can be on your screen in the back of your camera, or it can be in the viewfinder. On a DSLR, it's only gonna be on the back of the camera. With a mirrorless, you can actually see a live histogram on the back of the camera and in the viewfinder. And with a DSLR, you're only gonna see a histogram on the back of the camera. And you're only going to see that histogram for images you've already taken. So with a mirrorless camera, you get a live, okay, constantly refreshing histogram. And with a DSLR, you get a uh, post photo shot histogram, okay? A histogram is a box, a rectangular box uh, that has the left side of that box, okay, is considered the tope. That meaning your darks and underexposure, and your right side is considered the uh, shoulder, okay? And uh, that's for positive exposure. Whenever you, whenever you see your, it's like a mountain range. Sometimes it's a valley, sometimes it's small peak, sometimes it's a big peak, it varies. But this is the main and most important part of it is you never want the histogram climbing up the left wall 
and you never climb want it climbing up the right wall. If it climbs up the left wall, you're underexposed. If it's climbing up the right wall, you're overexposed. So what you have to do is you have to adjust either your ISO, your shutter speed or your f-stop to, to keep it within the box, to keep it away from, from the toe and keep it away from the shoulder. Is anybody confused with that? Can we go ahead and, and try unmuting everyone um, and see how that goes? Because I sure would like to hear people. I feel like a screen. There we go. Cool. I think we're good. John, did you do you kind of understand that? I, I do, I think. Yeah. I, I wrote it down too, so I'll Google it some more. Um, but that I think the general just makes sense. Yeah. So 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 let me throw this out to you guys. If you if you take a picture with your with your camera and then you look at your histogram and you see the wall is climbing up the toe, the left side of the screen. What does that mean you need to do? Do you need to add light or do you need to take light away? Add, add light. Exactly, you need to add light because you're underexposed. Okay, if it's going up the left wall, that clearly says I'm underexposed, okay? If it's climbing up the right wall, you have to do the opposite. You've got to take light away. Is that, does everybody pretty much grasp that? Okay, yes. this, mm -hmm. is, this is again where um, where it, things get a little more complicated, and I'll tell you why. Because you have to fix it, and you have to have some kind of comprehension of knowing how to fix it. Are you going to add light because you're going to raise the ISO? Are you going to add light because you're going to open the f-stop, you know, add more light through that lens opening? Or are you going to add light because you're going to slow your shutter speed down? Okay. And that's how you have to learn to think a little bit. Now, the other option is, what do you do? You put the camera in program mode, or you put the pro camera in shutter priority mode, or you put the camera in aperture priority mode. However, there's still a problem. Okay. When you use a program mode and your shot is underexposed, if you switch from program to shutter priority or to after priority, is that going to fix the problem? Anybody? What do you think? It's no, not. No, it, no, it, it doesn't. It, it's not because the the problem is based on the camera's metering system. It's it's reading the scene, and the scene is fooling it into thinking there's more light, or actually, yeah, that there's more light than what there really is, and therefore you're underexposed. And so. Um, in manual, in manual photography, you're going to adjust one of those three settings. If you're using shutter priority or after priority or program, does anybody know what you're going to adjust to fix the problem? Exposure compensation. Exactly. Who said that? Eric. Eric, Eric I don't see you. Where are you, buddy? I, I'm anonymous. You're anonymous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so exactly it is. Is does everybody? Does anybody not know what exposure compensation is? I don't. Okay. All all cameras, and some have a button on them, and some don't. Some you have to go into the menu to make the adjustment. Again, that's a bell and whistle. Okay. Uh, the more expensive cameras are going to have a button that you can access very quickly. Um, that will allow you to compensate for that. So the way an exposure compensation button works is this. You push the button in, you turn a dial or a knob uh, in a direction that allows it to add light, okay? Add light is gonna be the plus sign, right? Mm -hmm. So you're gonna adjust it so that it's plus, meaning you're adding more light, and then you're gonna see that histograms start to move away from the underexposure. And obviously we know the opposite. If your photo is too bright, it's gonna be what, minus. Mm -hmm. And then you're, okay. Now, this is what's cool with mirrorless. And one of the best things about mirrorless is that with the mirrorless, you can make those adjustments and you get a live feed in the viewfinder of the results. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you see that, 
it's within the histogram, within the range, you can take a picture. With a DSLR, it's different. With a DSLR, you got to take a picture. So you take a photo, and now you look at your histogram again, and you say, hey, I'm right there. Or I go, that eh, wasn't enough. So then you got to make another adjustment, and you got to take another photograph. Does everybody understand that? Yes. Okay. Now let me tell you one of the things that I do. Remember what I said, a lot of it is pre-preparation to photograph in something. Let's say I'm dry, I have a road I like to go drive down and shoot photos where I'll, I'll generally see some birds of prey. And let's say I'm driving down this road and behold, I see a raptor on a post up ahead on my left. And I know, mm, I bet you this guy's gonna wanna fly on me. And so I'm gonna wanna be mentally prepared, physically prepared, photographically prepared What's something do you think that we can do before we get to that bird to get ourselves prepared? Fix the settings on your camera Thank to you. for the speed versus I, the perch bird. I am trying to figure out who's talking to me. That's Nancy. 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 Okay, Nancy. That's exactly right. What you're going to do is you're going to stop your vehicle. You're going to point your lens in a direction that represents the same kind of perch, the same kind of area that your bird is in, and you're gonna take a photograph. You're gonna set the settings, you're gonna, and, and we, and, and this is, and again, this is where uh, um, I, I use this mentality of making decisions up front. I know I wanna photograph this bird. I know that more than likely it's perched now, but when I get up there, it may fly. So what am I gonna do? I am going to preset my camera in the event he's going to want to launch. So does that mean I'm going to set it at one five hundredth of a second? Nope. 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 What am I going to set it at? 4,000. I'm going to set it at 4,000 <laughs> of a second. <laughs> Amen. There we go. Yay. <laughs> Said that. Yay. Exactly. I'm going to set it at 4,000 of a second. See, this is mental preparation. This is how, this is how you approach doing bird photography. You've got to make decisions ahead of time okay and and making the right decisions will improve your success rate when you go to take the photograph okay so that's what i'll do i'll go okay i'm gonna set so before i even put the camera out the window all right let's say it's a sunny day let me tell you how i think i'm driving on the road okay i just saw the bird actually before i even got to the bird i pull over the side of the road hey it's a sunny day sun's to my left okay I'm going to look where the light's at, okay? Sun's to my left, and I'm going, it's sunny day. I'm going to set my ISO at 800 right now. Boom, 800. I'm going to set my shutter speed. Guess what? At 4,000th of a second. Why? It's a sunny day, okay? And then I'm going to put my f-stop at 5.6, most likely. And then I'll point, I'll point the lens out the window. I'll take a couple shots and I go, hey, buddy, you call that right. Pat myself on the back, drive down the road, go photograph that bird. You see how you prepare? That's how you prepare. So on and a so, cloudy hmm? day, what are your settings? On a cloudy day, I'm going to say to myself, first off, crap. <laughs> but once I get past that, uh, <laughs> Okay, in uh, if you would asked me that question three months ago, I would have said to you, I'm just going to focus on perch shots on an overcast day. But if you ask me that today, I'm going to say, well, bless God, I'm going to set my I'm going to set my ISO up to four thousand. Now I wouldn't have said that to you three months ago. I would have said, are you nuts? I, there is a software program out there that a lot of people are using. Um, it is called Topaz Denoise. Topaz Denoise. Topaz makes two software, uh, two softwares in their bundle. One is Topaz Denoise and the other is Topaz Denoise AI. And the other one is Topaz Sharpen AI. Okay. And when you get those programs, those programs will, will work uh, as a plugin for
or Lightroom or Photoshop, but they will also work as standalone. So if you don't use Photoshop or Lightroom, you can use the program as standalone. And the blessing of the program uh, of the uh, denoise is it does a marvelous job on removing noise. I mean, it, it, it's breathtaking how well it works. Um, and so because of that, I've actually started shooting at a higher ISO than I would ever have done in the past. Uh, in the past, I just wouldn't have done it. So keep that in mind. So now, if it's an overcast day, I'll do the same thing, except I'll just raise my ISO up. I'll still try for one four thousandth of a second. And in fact, if if my if I could show you a photo, I would show you a photo of of a Merlin I photographed that did exactly what I expected. He flew off of a post, and I got it in flight on an overcast day and really ugly weather with rain coming down. Okay, um, so again. The approach, that shutter speed approach is extremely important. It's foundational. If you, if you, if you anticipate action, start at one four thousandth of a second. If you anticipate perched, slow your ISO down and, and shoot your perched. Um, one of the things that, you know, obviously you have to become aware about, and I'm, since most of you are birders, you probably already understand this. And that is, there are some birds that when you're 100 yards away, they're just going to take off because they're jerks. Let's just face it. Some birds are just jerks. They just don't like us. They don't know that we have no vicious intent. They think that we're there to knock, to cut off their head or something. I, don't, I have no idea, but they just, boom, they're gone. American kestrels. <laughs> love the bird. It doesn't love me. Probably doesn't love you guys either. I mean, they're just that way. Okay. But let me tell you a bird I love. The Merlin. Oh my word, the Merlin, he's my friend, right? When I see a Merlin, I no longer think this guy's going to take off. Most of the time, they stay on the perch. It's marvelous. I, I've ha I have photographed Merlins over the last two years where literally I'm on a two-lane road and they're on a, on a fence post to my left. And I, and I come right up to them. I pull over on the right-hand side of the road. So then between us is two lanes. And they just sit there and then, yeah, okay, do your thing, buddy. And I'm tickled pink. What do you think I'm doing? I'm shooting perch shots at one five hundredth of a second. You know, I've got a shot where I shot at F10. I mean, that's that's a pretty small opening. And I got great photos of that bird, okay? So, you know, that's why it's very important to understand your subject, understand uh, what their tendencies are. Now, if that had been a Kestrel, oh, no, 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 no. I would have been one four thousandth of a second, and I would have started slowing down and creeping on him with my car from about 100 yards, and it's still, it rarely works. I did have a Kestrel recently that was nice to me, and I did get a little closer, but he didn't, he gave me five or 10 seconds. But this, again, is why what? This is why you pre-prepare. You get your camera set up for that shot. So the moment, the very moment you stop your car, you have a split second to get that photograph and it's gone. Okay. And sometimes it doesn't work, but you know, sometimes it does. And sometimes you walk away with something spectacular. Is that kind of answered? Now, let me ask you something. Let me throw this out at you. What do you think is better in the long run? Do you think it's better to photograph a bird on a bright sunny day or on an overcast day? Depends. Okay. <laughs> Give me throw out, throw some info out. Why the do you think it depends? The sun with the contrast, depending on where you're at, mm -hmm. can, the shadows and the light can really create some problems. Very, very, very right. That's exactly right. The main problem that we experience with an overcast day is if the bird is elevated, the higher the bird gets, you've got to point your lens up higher, you end up shooting into a white sky, which is a drag. But yes, you know, in portraiture, and, and I started out in portrait photography, uh, you, loved, you loved days with clouds. Why? Because the light was soft and the light was flattering. 
It doesn't mean that I don't enjoy an opportunity uh, to photograph a bird with sunshine. It's just that now I've got to be pickier. Sunshine is not very forgiving. And, 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 and I will tell you the main rule when it comes to photographing a bird on a bright sunny day is keep the bird within the 180 degree pattern that's in front of you. You never want the light starting to drift past that 180 degree mark because when it does, it becomes unflattering, right? So you always have to be very aware. And how do you, how do you control that? Well, you control that once again, this is something that you can make a decision about before <coughs> you get to the subject, okay? And understand a lot of what I'm saying deals with driving the car around. It's a little different when you're walking because they see you, they're gone, okay? But I will always try when I look at a subject uh, on a sunny day, I will look at the direction of the light. I will see how the light's hitting the subject. And then I will try to position myself uh, so that I am basically moving the light source. I'm not physically moving it. I'm moving it simply because I'm changing my position. And as I change my position, the light source changes its angle and the way it's illuminating the subject. Very, very important. Uh, lighting is very, very important, not only for exposure, but also for complementing the subject, right? Yes. Is, is everybody pretty much on board with the two basic scenario approaches on photographing birds? Okay. Yeah. Anybody have any questions up to now? Okay. Um, is everybody kind of pretty clear as far as uh, what kind of camera they want, what kind of lens they want? I have a question about that. Okay. Um, I'm really interested in at least trying out, if not actually investing in a Nikon 200 to 500 millimeter lens. Right. I'm concerned it's going to be too heavy. The price is really decent compared to all the other options <laughs> that are out there. Right. Um, but it's not so much a price thing, but it's just, I'm worried it's going to be too heavy or not as versatile as I expect it to be. I've got a D7200 and uh, just the kit lens that goes up to, what is it, 70 to 300 or 50 to 300, something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that when this is all said and done, you guys don't say, man, Lou is really opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, let, me, let me tell you something. I, I just got to get this out. Okay. I'm old school. I believe, I believe in the old ways. I believe in the old rules because they, they worked for so many people for a very, very long time. And everybody now wants to just shirk it all off and say, we've reinvented this whole thing. And I just want to go, hey, so you think, uh, no, you haven't reinvented it. You're losing sight of, of how you do it correctly. And, and when I, I ran into a guy on YouTube last year, I'm going to be honest with you, he ticked me off. He really did because he was very condescending about people who wear camo and he was very condescending about people who use tripods. He basically said either, either type of person is stupid and they don't know what they're doing. And I, and I, and you know, I made my comments. Because you know what? It, it's not stupid. Uh, I've been in a lot of situations with a lot of other photographers. Uh, and I'm not trying, and understand, I'm not trying to knock anyone down who is walking around with the camera in their hand with the camera strap. Not at all. But I want you to understand that don't, that you have to make your own decisions. You can't let a trend, and the trend these days is, oh, let me walk around with this big heavy lens over my shoulder, okay? And not use a tripod. Uh, that's a trend. And you can't let that affect you. I don't let it affect me. Now, I have a secondary reason. I have been doing photography for so long and I have carried so much equipment that I literally have a bad back. And I'm not kidding you when I say this. If I, uh, I recently went out and shot with someone and I had my, Nikon D500 with a 200 to 500 millimeter lens. And I was holding it in my hand the entire time. I didn't even have a camera strap. 
And before it was all said and done, I would say within 30 minutes to an hour, I was having back pain. Uh-huh. And it, my back pain got to the level after after a couple hours that I was at an eight. And uh, at that point, even after I get past the pain, my back feels sore for hours. Um, I just don't qualify for, for walking around with a camera like that. And I will tell you that a lot of people who do today may pay for it tomorrow because I do. I, I pay for all those early years where I decided I was in beast mode and I could do that. Well, I'm paying for that beast mode now. And you, so you have to make decisions um, that are going to serve you best in the long run. And, and my, I'm a firm believer in either using a monopod or using a tripod uh, and only carrying a camera on a strap just in those rare, unique situations. Um, and and it's, be, it's because of one big word, and that word is called fatigue, okay? Everybody understand fatigue? When you fatigue your muscle, when you fatigue your muscles, what begins to happen? <coughs> Pain. You start shaking. They start shaking. Oh yeah. And if you start shaking, what is that going to do when you try to take pictures? <laughs> you can't. It's going to be blurry. Blurry. It. It's going to affect. It's going to affect your image. It's going to affect your shots. So what I like about I will I have uh, a um, a Gitsu tripod. In fact, I have a Series Five, so it's got really big diameter legs, and it and even though it's carbon fiber, it's it's got some weight to it. Um. But I carry that. Uh, one year when I was in Florida, I carried it a total of nine and a half miles in one day on my shoulder trying to get some shots. Um, what did I learn from that? That's when I bought my Nikon 200 to 500. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a backpack and I can stick it all in the backpack. But anyway, the, the, the thing is this. The point that I'm making is that, yes, I did nine and a half miles, but I didn't do it in one straight shot. I could walk a while and I could put the tripod down and the camera down and I'm not holding anything. That's the benefit of a tripod. And that's the benefit of a monopod is that, you know, you're walking and at some point you can set it down and all that weight's off you. You've, mm-hmm. you, you've gotten rid of it. When you walk around with a camera on a strap over your shoulder, how are you going to get rid of it? You're going to lay it on the ground? I mean, what are you going to do with it? You, you really can't get rid of it. It's, it's, it's part of your body, and it's going to be there the whole time. And that entire time it's there, your body's become more and more and more and more fatigued. Whereas when I'm going out with a tripod, when, as soon as I set it down, my body's recovering. It's in recovery mode, right? And so I'm not going to build up that fatigue like someone who's carrying it around. And so that's, that's the benefit the one of the, that's the physical benefit. Let's talk about the photographic benefit. A couple of years ago, I was with a couple of friends. Both of them were holding the zooms, you know, like a Tamron 150 to 600. And I, I, I had my big tripod and I had my big lens and I had it set on the ground and I was standing behind it. Well, in front of us is a young red Fox. Okay. And so they're both there and I'm there. Now, what's cool about a tripod is that I've got it all set up and I've already got it pointed at my subject. It's out, it's literally in place on the subject. Now, what do they both have? They both got 150, 600s over their shoulder. And so what happens? Oh, it looks like he's gonna do something. So you put the camera up and you're holding it. And then what happens after a few seconds? This is getting heavy. You put it yep. down, right? Yep. What do I what do I never have to put down with a tripod? I never have to put the camera down. Why? Because I'm not holding it. The tripod's not getting tired, and I'm not getting tired. All of a sudden, guess what happened? That fox took off like the Dickens. Who guess who got the shot? You did. I did. They didn't get the shot. Because by the time they pulled the camera up to put it on the subject, the subject was gone. Okay. So again, that's preparation. You're anticipating. And that's the beauty of having a tripod is whether it's an animal or whether it's a bird. If you're, if you're out and about and you come upon a subject, 
you can put the lens on the subject and keep it on the subject and be at the ready where when you're walking around with the camera over your shoulder, you're not at the ready. Mm -hmm. Once again, let me be clear. It's a preference thing. You know, it's totally up to you. I'm just explaining to you right now. I'm just explaining to you the difference and what to anticipate and how it affects you ergonomically, physically, but also how it can affect your, your shot. Now, what's an advantage of carrying a camera around on the shoulder? What do you think might be an advantage? You can pull it up real quick. You can pull it up quick, but there's something. Tracking something the birds. Important. Tracking them in flight, because I was wondering with the tripod, <clears throat> I go out to Maxi Park a lot because it's a block and a half from my house. Right. I take the camera and I have that ability to be able to track with the bird as it flies across. And if it Let goes up a little in. down a little. So how do you do that? Do you, are you able to do that with the tripod? That's, that's exactly what I was getting at. And in the medical field, we call that range of motion okay when you're when you're holding a camera in your hand and you're not dealing with the actual tripod and its legs you have increased range of motion period now the other cool thing about a tripod is you can have a tripod with you and you can take the camera off the tripod at any time you want so that's that's another factor that you have to consider but range of motion is very very important you can only you can only move so far with the tripod, whereas if you're hand holding, you could literally turn around if you needed to. Okay. So, really, again, what it comes down to between the two is the physical effects that, it, that holding the camera for an extended period of time is going to have on you. Right. That's why, really, in a perfect world, you have a small, lightweight tripod with a gimbal head. Uh, and, and, and at any moment, you can take it off and you have a strap. And now you've You've got it over your shoulder. That's the perfect world. But I have, you know, I have a two a Nikon 200 to 500 zoom, which gives me uh, a shorter focal length range, but also more portability. <laughs> but then I have a 600 millimeter Nikon F4, which is a huge beast. And there's no way Lou Curtis is going to handhold that thing. I mean, I'm <laughs> going to be, I'm, I'm going to be all over the map. I mean, I don't know how people do it. I, I've, I've got a couple of friends that that hand holds 600 millimeter lenses. And I look at them and go, gosh, you know, how you, I don't understand it. I don't know how they do it. Cause I can't do it. I just can't literally, even with the 200 to 500, I cannot keep the lens pointed at the same spot. Even while I'm taking the photos and a bird's on a perch. If I showed you my photos, you guys would laugh. Literally you go, you call yourself a wildlife photographer. That's why I use a tripod. I know my weaknesses. And so that's part of it too. A friend of mine, very good uh, wildlife photographer, he'll go out and photograph ducks and stuff, flight shots, and he'll have the shutter speed at 500th of a second, and he's hand-holding a 600 millimeter lens, and he gets great photos. Those are things you're going to learn about yourself. You're going to learn over time what you can and what you can't do. Uh, I cannot hold equipment for an extended period of time due to physical limitations. I can't keep the lens in the same spot of the scene due to physical limitations. I know that my right hand, as I've gotten older, I have a twin, he's got the same problem. I have little micro shakes sometimes in my right hand. That's a problem, okay? Uh, and so you have, to, you have to go out and experiment and practice and find out what you can and what you can't do. Lewis Curtis is never gonna be a 500th of a second track that bird in flight and get these fantastic shots even with the tripod i can't do it i suck at it i'm gonna be honest i just, i'm terrible at it some of you will probably blow me away with that stuff i know what i can and i know what i can't do you know i sometimes i get stupid and i go out and say oh today's the day i'm gonna get it today i'll do it and i take a thousand shots and i don't have one i like <laughs> okay it sucks i do that every day um, yeah <laughs> Now, let me tell you another advantage to a tripod. A couple of years ago, I was uh, at a place uh, up in Louisville where there's a, a dam and there's copious amounts of water coming through sort of a river and the was traveling at a very high rate of speed. There was a, a great egret perched on a rock in the middle of this water. 
and I took some shots and I think, you know, the shot looks okay, but my gosh, you know, I don't like the, I don't like the water being so sharp. I'd like to see the water blurred. I'd like to get that effect. So here I am with my tripod, my gimbal head and my 600 millimeter lens. And I said, bless God, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. So what did I do? I broke, I, I completely did something I would never ever do. I put my, I put my camera on ISO 100. Okay. I put my shutter speed at one thirtieth of a second. And then I set my F stop. I don't know, F eight or something like that. What, what did I do when I did that? You slowed the shutter speed down so that the, the water actually was flowing during that time the shutter was opened. Exactly. And so what I've got is I've got blurred water that's blurred, that's, that's the, because the water is moving from left to right. If the water was moving toward me, it would have been a whole different ball game. But because it was moving across from left to right, I could go at that slow shutter speed and it's blurring. Now, what else did I need? I needed a bird that was perfectly still because if it wasn't at 30th of a second, I would have a soft bird. So it's a situation. You have to adjust the situations. And you have to, under, and this again is, is uh, why you need to understand what a shutter speed does and what an f-stop does. Shutter speeds control motion. Use a slower shutter speed when something's moving, you're gonna get blurred. Use a faster shutter speed when something's moving, you're gonna get a sharp picture, right? Use a wide opening on a lens, you're gonna get shallow depth of field. That means the area in front and the area behind the point of focus is going to be more out of focus. Use a smaller f-stop like f11, f22. You're going to increase that range. You're going to have more area in front and more area behind your point of focus that's going to be sharp. There's a rule. There's an old rule to that. And that is that, that one third of the area in front of your point of focus will be sharp. Two thirds of the area behind your point of focus is going to be sharp. Now, how, how long or how broad that area is depends on a few factors, okay? And these are the factors. Focal length of the lens, okay? If you're using a wide angle lens, it, it, you're gonna have a, a much more amount of depth of field in front and behind your point of focus. As that lens gets longer and we start getting to, into a 600 millimeter lens, it's going to come down to maybe a few feet or a few inches, depending on the f-stop. Okay, so the focal length of the lens is one of the first things that controls depth of field. The longer the focal length, the shallower the depth of field. Okay, the next thing that controls your depth of field, and we've talked about it, f-stop. Your f-stop controls your depth of field. Okay, so the the wider, in other words, the smaller the number, the shallower the depth of field. The bigger the number, the smaller the opening, the greater the amount of depth of field, right? Um, and there's one more thing that, that controls depth of field. Does anybody know what it is? Lens to subject distance. The further you are from the subject, the more depth of field you're going to get. The closer you get to the subject, the less depth of field you're going to get. So let's say you're in a situation. Let me give an example of how this plays out. Let's say you're in a situation and you've got several small birds, maybe three birds, all on the same branch, okay? And you can't, you know, because of light and restrictions, you can't get any more f-stop, all right? You don't want to go higher on your ISO, but you want to get more depth of field. What can you do based on what I just said? Remember what? Focal length. Lens of subject distance f stop. You can't you can't use the f stop, right? You don't want to change your focal length. So what can you do? Change the lens of subject distance. So what does that mean? Back away. Move back five feet. Move back ten feet. What did you just do? You just increased your depth of field because you've changed your lens of subject distance. Okay. Again, this is why you want. The more that you understand the mechanisms that control photography, the more quickly you will be able to make decisions and adjustments. How, how many of you ever watched MacGyver when it came out? Again, it kind of dates me, but there used to be a series called MacGyver. Right? 
when you're a photographer, you have to learn to be a MacGyver. Period. You. And and why is that? Because you you end up in all these situations and you end up with you know what you want, but how do I get it? Okay. And 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 you look around and you go, well, I've got this tool, I've got I've got the F stop, I've got the shutter speed, I've got the a tripod, or I got a mono. You look at all the things that all the tools that you have around you and you're able to grab the right tools to pull off the MacGyver to get what you want. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Years ago, uh, my um, in-laws lived in Minneapolis and uh, I used to shoot Hasselblad back in, back in those days. And um, we went to a place I'd never been to before. And there was a beautiful, beautiful waterfall. I mean, it was just gorgeous. And I'm one of these guys, I'm a romantic, so I like blurred soft water, okay? I don't like the sharp, sharp water. And I'm like, gosh, I don't, I didn't bring my tripod. And that's yes, beautiful waterfall, I want to photograph it. Now I've got my MacGyver moment. I can either be a successful MacGyver or I can walk away with my chin down. I'm like, okay, I don't have a tripod and I want to get this shot. I really want to get this shot, but I need to shoot at like one second, okay? Well, I can't handhold one second. So I'm thinking and thinking, and all of a sudden I, hey, I got this camera bag. Oh, wait a minute. The bottom of the camera is flat. I've got a camera bag. So I took that camera bag. I scrunched it all up. There was a, a, a stone wall. I put it on the stone wall. I put the camera on there. I cradled it in a, in a certain way. I put my camera on one second. I got the photograph. I MacGyvered it. That's what, that's what you want to learn to be. The more familiar you become with your equipment and all the different tools that you have around you, the more you can adapt to situations and get the photograph that you want. So a question on that. Yeah. Do you use a, those cable shutter releases or do you just, my problem is sometimes on when I use a tripod is when I press it down, I shake it when I press it down. Right. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with using the cable release. I knew, uh, I met a photographer uh, several years ago. Um, I think it was in Oklahoma at a, at a wildlife refuge. And he was shooting from his car with a tripod using a cable release. And so, yeah, you know, that's, that's just going to stabilize your image more and, and cut back on vibration. Now, he had had several strokes, so he had a big problem with shakes and such. Uh, and so that was, that was his way. You know, he saw an issue he had. He deduced how he could work his way around it and be successful. And sometimes that's what you have to do, right? Right. Um, um, anybody have any questions? Anything else they want to ask me? I have a question. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. Um, so I want to learn, you know, like what you're talking about, to be able to manually use my camera, et cetera. Um, and you know, I bought the little books. I have a, a D90 uh -huh. and, um, but it's just, if I don't do it, you know, then I forget it, you know? And so, um, so that's one thing with I, being retired now as I'm taking a lot of time with my camera, but, um, you know, tech has a, like a continuing education class. It's a photography, um, set, um, uh, it's like four or five different classes. Do you know anything about those? Would those be beneficial to me, you think? Oh. No. <laughs> no. Did you say no? And I'll, okay. tell, and I, and I'll tell you why. I used to teach, <laughs> I, I used to teach continuing ed uh, uh -huh. a long time ago. Uh, and, this is, and this is the problem that you have. And, and it's what I addressed when, we, when I, we first started this, this class today. And that is that everybody learns at a different rate. Okay. We all absorb at a different rate of speed. And, and you, in, in a class situation, you can't hit the pause button and say, you know, I, I don't get that because he's got to teach to the group and not to a person. And so what's best for you is to adapt your situation to learning as a person. Now, I, I'm gonna, let me, first, let me say this to everybody, understand something. I'm a nice guy. Uh, it means I don't get girlfriends, but it means I'm nice. And, and so, and what I mean by that is, is I'm a helper. I like helping people. I like encouraging people. And so, and so what I'm basically saying is, you know, I, I'm a phone call away. In fact, if you go to my Facebook page, first off, feel free to friend me on Facebook. 
Okay, Lewis Curtis Photography. I have my phone number posted on there. You can reach out to me by text. If you text me, though, let me know who you are. If you call me, I'm probably not going to answer because there's so much spam calls. You might want to text me and say, hey, Lou, I'm going to call you. Or you just text me. Ask me any question you want. You want any help? I don't care if it's a year from now. Reach out to me. That's the way I am. Because yeah, this is a this is a field that I love. And, and if, if I want to be one thing in life, and that's an I want to be an encouragement. That that's that's the way I feel like I need to be, and that's the way I want to be. And so I will I will never turn anyone away. I will will never not answer a question. If I don't get back to you right away, it could be I just for example. If you were to message me on Facebook, sometimes you don't see those. They don't, it doesn't come up and go, boop, 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 boop. By the way, you just got to text me. It doesn't do that. Now, if you text me on my phone, it'll show I can read the text. Facebook doesn't always show that. So, so understand, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's not clear that you've gotten, I will never intentionally um, not respond to you. Okay. So never take it that way. Well, thank it's, you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, if you if you need advice on equipment decisions, things like that, anything, I I will answer any question. I might even help you if you have a marriage problem. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so so yeah, that's just the way I am. Um, okay. Well, thank you. I like I said, that. my phone number is on my Facebook page. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram, and everything everything I'm on is Lewis Curtis Photography. Okay. okay. Um, and I had another thought that I was something I was going to address here a second ago when I, I'm 60 now, so I'm having my 61 here. So You're just a kid, the <laughs> mind, the mind seems to be devolving, you know? Yes. Um, I understand. <laughs> yeah. Lewis, I, I want to thank you for your time tonight. Wow. You, you shared a lot of good information. I really yeah, appreciate you. it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, and does anybody have any last questions? I, I have a quick one. <clears throat> okay. I have, I bought a Tamron um, 18 to 400 this past spring for my Canon Rebel. It's going to be a slow lens. That's going to be a slow lens. That might be a 5.6 to a 6.3 lens just because of that. Yes. When you it whenever is. you buy whenever you buy a lens that has a long range like that, it, it it's going to have a lot of barrel expansion as you go through the zoom, and it's going to end up being it's going to absorb a lot of light. It it uh, does. But, My question yeah. is, I've never had this ever happen, and I've been playing around with photography for years. There's a piece of dirt inside the lens, not on the back of the lens not in between my filters that are on there. I mm -hmm. pulled it out the other day, looking down the barrel of it, you know, in here, like down a level, there's this piece of dirt that's the size of a pencil head that shows up on all of my pictures in the right hand. On... Yes. Now, now, let me ask you, have you taken the lens off the camera? Yes. Okay, and so when you take the lens off the camera and you're holding the lens, you can see it. Yes. Okay, then you'll have to take it in and have it sent in somewhere. So I would have to get it sent out, right? There's you nobody would. that could do it. I'd have to send it back to Tamron, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. I have never had that happen. It's odd because those are sealed systems generally. It's just very, that is very weird. Yeah. yeah, so I have to edit it out on any picture I want to actually do anything with. Yeah. Where does it show up? It's in the uh, lower right-hand corner. Okay, so well, it tends not to at least be, you know, yeah. in the center of the picture. But yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah. And I'm able to work around it to, for the most part. Right. But it's irritating that you have to go through and you have to edit it every time. Exactly. So... Huh. Let, I just remembered one of the things I was going to talk to you about. Um, you know, obvi obviously, uh, when you're driving around in a car to take photographs, it's uh, the best lens support you could possibly use in a car is a beanbag, photographic beanbag, okay? Uh, 
you generally don't want to set the camera on the windowsill itself because that's very rigid and it's hard to keep the camera as steady because that windowsill area is kind of curved. And so a bean bag sort of conforms, the upper part sort of conforms to the, the lens itself. And so it's a much better support. And understand this, because they call it a bean bag, doesn't mean you fill it with beans. There is a there is a certain filler that you can find, I think maybe at B and H or on Amazon. It, it comes from a plant. It's I wish I could remember the name of it, but it, it's a dark material, very very small, very lightweight, and that's what you fill your bean bag with. Um, so just be aware of that. Bean bag is very very. And the other cool thing about a bean bag is, um, like with my car, I'll put the bean bag on the windowsill, but if I have to point the camera up higher, I'll raise the window up and the bean bag will rest on the window and my camera is resting on that. So has any of you ever tried doing that? Yeah. So just always remember lens stabilization. The, the biggest <coughs> culprit for failed photography is vibration, which leads me to another thing. Not only do, should you invest in a bean bag, what do you think the very first thing you need to do when you stop your car to take a photograph. Turn your car off. Turn off, turn off, the, car. Turn off the car. Exactly. Now, if you're, holding, if you're holding the lens up, probably not gonna be a problem for you. You can probably have it running. But if, you're, if that lens is literally resting on your car, you need to turn the engine off. Otherwise, that vibration going through the car is gonna transfer through your camera body and lens. And it will affect, it will affect your shots, period. Um, one last thing to note, and I've noticed that what I'm about to say changes depending on whether I'm using a mirrorless or whether I'm using a DSLR. And that's a thing called VR, vibration reduction. A lot of people uh, have a misconception when it comes to vibration reduction. They think that it's something that you turn on and leave on, and it's not. Vibration reduction, if you're shooting with a DSLR, should only be used if you're shooting under a thousandth of a second and less. You should never have it on if you're above a thousandth of a second. And the reason is uh, it will have an adverse, it can have an adverse effect on your image instead of being beneficial. Okay, so always remember that. If you're if a thousandth of a second or less, VR on. If you're above a thousandth, VR off, okay? Um, mirrorless cameras, I've got a mirrorless camera and I, I can turn the VR on or it's on and it's not a problem at all. Now, if you're shooting video, uh, you know that when you shoot video, it's not the same thing as shooting stills, right? So everybody kind of, and what I mean by that is one of the things I'll, I used to have a Fuji system and uh, I really liked it a lot, but one of the things I found out about the Fuji system was that when I shot video and when I shot stills, it was using the same part of the camera, the same brain of the camera, meaning that I had to change everything when I went from one to the other. One of the things I love about Nikon is that it has a switch to go from still to video. And when I'm shooting video on my Nikon, the settings are totally independent. So like, let me give you an example. When you shoot video, the proper way of shooting video is that you set a frame rate when you're shooting video. So let's say you set a frame rate of 30 frames per second in your menu system, okay? That means that your shutter speed should be twice the frame rate, okay? Twice the frame rate. So if your frame rate is 30 frames per second, your shutter speed should be a 60th of a second. Okay, if your frame rate is 60, 60 frames per second, your shutter speed should be 1 25th of a second. All right, so the shutter speed is always twice. It should never be more than that. All right, and that's why it's important to have a system that has an independent uh, exposure system for the video than for stills. So, so what happens is this, if I go out with my mirrorless and I'm shooting stills and I decide, oh, I want to shoot some video, I flip the switch, and automatically, when I flip that switch, my shutter speed is at a 60th because I got the frame rate at, at 30 frames per second, 
and my ISO is 100. And so now all I've got to do is change my f-stop based on the amount of light and I'm shooting video, okay? So uh, again, video settings completely different than uh, still settings. And the reason that's the case is because if you if you start to use faster shutter speeds, you sort of you sort of get a robotic look to the resulting video of motion of subjects moving, and so you want there to be inherently a level of movement and blur that makes the video look natural and cinematographic. Okay, I don't know if all I know I, I'm at the point now where uh, if I've got a perch subject, I'm I'm shooting video all the time as well as stills and videos becoming more and more popular. People are, if you're on Instagram, you'll see more and more people are posting video clips. Um, anyway, I guess I can talk a lot, by the way. Oh, you've Sorry. A lot of great Apologize. Great Apologize to me. No, thank you. Um, any last questions before we go? No, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Did I answer everybody's question that they needed to know? Is it you got to figure it out to go out and photograph perched or flying birds? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you. Lord bless yeah. all of you. Thank you for, uh, for joining. Lou, do you think maybe you could Thank share you. your slides with us later in a, an email to me or something? Uh, you know what I can do is I can actually convert it to a PDF. Perfect. The slideshow? Yeah. And, uh, and, and I, I can I can send it to you that way. Okay, thank you. And that way I could share it. I, I would love to share that if, if since you put the time in it. But okay, cool. thank you so much. I really appreciate you and everyone who attended tonight. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Linda. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Thanks. Thank everybody. everybody.